It's four old origami. This is, as you can see, not the biggest thing in the world. It's about a few feet longer than a caravan. Okay, so there were some people who frankly astonishingly got through the full uh, hour and 20 minutes or something of the Atlantic crossing and they said they'd like a boat tour. Now, the boat is no longer in the water. Um, it's actually sitting in a caravan storage park. Um, so I'm inside it now. So um, it's not exactly a great example of what the boat should look like. Uh, I've got the cockpit just filled with stuff from inside the boat. I kind of cleared a bit of space so you can kind of see what's going on. But I, I mean, to be honest, there's not a huge amount to tour in here. It's pretty small space. So um, I'll try and talk you through what we've got. Um, <laughs> It's actually a bit limited in general. I think this video is probably only going to be a few minutes long. Um, so we've got essentially two bunks, one there and one there. Um, they're actually quite wide, pretty generous, uh, probably a bit too wide to be a good sea berth. They should probably be a bit narrower. Uh, I think the original design is meant to have some storage over here, which actually would make it a bit smaller. I kind of ran out of time to build that um, and ended up with these nets, which actually I think work out a bit better. They're light. Uh, you can take them off, you can remove them completely if you want, um, and that works pretty well. Uh, over in this corner, this is my little navigation corner, um, I guess, at the side of the boat. So, uh, standard Horizon VHF, it's actually, it's pretty cheap, it works. Um, the, the light on it is insanely bright at night, um, even in its dark mode. Um, it's uh, probably not perfect for a sailing yacht. Uh, there's, yeah, the, you actually need better night vision on that, so... I suggest if you are going to buy a VHF unit, then you should take a look at see how bright the actual night mode is on there. Even without any light, backlight, it was still surprisingly light. Um, got the plotter here. Uh, it's a B&G uh, Axiom, no, Vulcan 7R, whatever that is. Um, it's it's good. Totally unnecessary for ocean crossing, as far as I can see. I mean, it's, it's really handy. You can see all the AIS targets on it. Um, plotting courses, stuff like that, great. Um, absolutely drinks the amps though, unfortunately. So I think it actually draws something like one and a half amps, which doesn't sound very much, but over the course of a day, I mean, that's a fair old chunk of your battery power when really, you're not really looking at it. The main advantage of this one is that you can plug a transducer straight into it. So there's no separate transducer to any MA converter to plotter. So you don't need a separate unit for that. You can network it all together. Um, this talks to that, which talks to the two GPS antennas on the outside, which talks to this, which is the AIS unit, um, all with a very simple network. Um, it's it's frighteningly expensive to just buy network cables, um, but it is, I think, worth it. So there's a lot of redundancy. The, the unit itself has an internal antenna, um, and also I've got the external one, uh, which takes in not just the... American GPS signal, but also the European one and the Russian one as well, as far as I know. Um, so actually it should have quite a lot of backup um, in terms of that. The AIS unit also has its own GPS antenna. Um, so that is actually, you can select which source you want in terms of location from here. So it can either be the internal, the external one, or the AIS unit. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of backup there. The VHF unit also networks so that it gets its location from here. Um, and so when you pull, press the button, if you program it with the MMSI, then that distress signal goes out with your location, which is good news. Um, other stuff over here, yeah, the AIS unit. This is a digital digital yacht unit. Um, it's the AIT2000. Um, so it's class B, so it's transmitting as well as receiving. Um, it is fantastic. Can't fault this thing whatsoever. I had one problem with it where I hadn't tightened up this nut here uh, on the antenna itself um, that was just user error the rest of it flawless performance the unit is largely waterproof i think only these two connectors are the non waterproof um, type however realistically they're they're pretty watertight um, anyway it draws almost nothing like it's 0.3 of an amp or something um, when it's in it's well when it's when it's on so actually you're getting a, a really efficient use of power. The case is, I think, metal. Um, it's pretty indestructible. In hindsight, I probably would have mounted this the other way around. So these are more protected from feet under here. It 
also is a bit of a compromise in the location. Like it really could be somewhere else, possibly higher up. Um, but, uh, but yeah, on the back side of here, I have the splitter for it as well. It's also an, a digital yacht unit. Um, worked perfectly, got really good range on the AIS targets. Some of them were you know, 10 plus miles away, which gives you more than enough time to do something about an AIS target coming on. Um, fantastic piece of kit. And then over here, um, this was the EPIRB mount. Well, it is, still is the EPIRB mount. Uh, EPIRB just sits in there. Um, so everything that you kind of need to navigate and emergency stuff was there. The GPS mount, so I wanted to be able to to do navigation inside plus also outside, obviously. Uh, so I wanted something that would uh, swing into place. So this is just a 3D printed block and bits in here. There's a bit of 5 mil threaded rod that sits down here. And then on the bottom of it, I've just got a nut. I might be able to see the threaded rod attachment here. It's just I bent it over, dropped it in a slot in the 3D print. And then you can tighten it up here. Um, and that's angled so that... It is always vertical, even though this um, this bulkhead is at 22 degrees. Um, and that seemed to work pretty well. It's pretty robust. Swings it out of the way. It comes forward a bit too far. Um, potentially, if I had another joint in it, it, you would be able to make it go a bit further back. But that's a really lightweight and easy way of having navigation inside and outside. Seems to work pretty well. Pretty happy with that one, to be honest. Um, Bunks-wise, these are just some, I think it's 100 mil foam, 75, 75 mil foam maybe, I bought online, cut them down to the right size, went to the local sewing alteration shop, they knocked me up these covers for next to nothing, which was fantastic, this is just some rucksack fabric that amazingly I just happen to have in the house, but um, uh, yeah, it's, you can just buy it online for not a huge amount, um, and that worked pretty well, so I think these these cushions were I don't know, near enough, I think maybe £100 or something, so really it's surprisingly expensive for a cushion, but also it's very nice to have a proper cushion uh, here, that's for sure. Um, what else have we got in this corner? Um, the, the, as I say, the bunks are pretty generous. I gotta lie down in here, put your feet in the, the kind of trotter box. It's actually loads of space, and I'm five foot eleven or something. Um, I've got a few extra inches here, a few extra inches down the bottom. Um, so actually, yeah, it's pretty pretty comfortable. That little access hatch down there that you can see, I don't know you can see that, I'll do that. That little access hatch just goes into the watertight compartment at the back. Um, I added that just so there is a way to get in there from inside, just in case um, of any disaster. So I have a lead cloth. It is super simple. So the lead cloth is literally a piece of garden chair fabric. Again, bought online for next to nothing. Screwed into place here, um, and then it's got these clips on the bottom. So, these clip into place, it's a pretty fiddly process, but when you're in the bunk, you've got a lead cloth like that, so there's no way that you can fall out of that bunk, it's nice and high, so even if the boat went, you know, really far over, you'd still be alright. There's a number of things I'd do differently on these, for sure. Um, for starters, the, the lead cloth starts right at the edge of the bunk. I would have maybe started it a bit further back down here so that it's a bit, it's kind of pulling you in a bit. Um, these ideally should be adjustable um, and they're a bit of a fiddle to clip into place. I mean, they work, but they're not, they're not perfect. Uh, this one is, I mean, all kinds of horrible around here. Um, but it, yeah, otherwise it seems to work. These clips, pretty low quality, um, as you can see. But yeah, what I mean is um, I would probably start the lead cloth further back here but have a think about that um, given that you can need to have your lockers opening as well so all the lockers on this boat have latches so they don't open unless you do this so if the boat actually did roll none of the stuff would fall out that's the plan everything on the the storage side of the boat is still made out of nine mil ply I've got these stiffeners on the bottom here um, it's probably massively heavy compared to what you can actually get away with in one of these boats um, uh, in here I've got the stuff. This is just rig, rigging stuff. There's a lot of weight in there. Just, yeah, it's not where everything sits when it's actually uh, under sail. And it is still disgusting as well. You know, I've got a bit of cleaning to do. Um, but yeah, so you've got a lot of storage under there. Got the same under this one. So this one contains an immersion suit, bit of the outboard. Um, 
random bits of warp and stuff um, in there. On this side, same again. So that, I think, I can't remember that, I had all my tools and my spares and stuff in there. Uh, so in here, we've also got the pump system. So there is a hand bilge pump here. Open that, take that handle, and that slots in there. And then that pump is selectable. So at the moment, it's draining the sink, which is disgusting, but it's draining the sink to this True Design stopcock here. So True Design stuff built in New Zealand. Uh, it's all uh, fiber reinforced plastic, absolutely brilliant. Um, basically maintenance free. Um, so that's it in the open position, that's it shut. But um, at the moment, if you pump the pump, it drains the sink. If you adjust this to there, then it's pumping through this valve system, which at the moment it's open to here. So you could pump and you could empty the main compartment of the boat um, in here. If you then select that this way, you end up pumping out of this particular piece of line hose here. And that piece of hose there is long enough to reach this spigot here, which currently has a bung in it, but can be removed. And then that allows you to pump out the forward compartment. And then in the aft compartment here, so I've still got the first aid kit in, there is the same setup down there. And you can plug in to the aft compartment, drain, and then drain that in there. Um, this hose is a loop which allows the, there's a pump in the cockpit that allows you to select that and then you can do the same from the cockpit. So this piece of hose is long enough to connect either back to the aft compartment, so you could drain the aft compartment, to the main compartment, you put it in with a strumbox on, or you could bring it all the way through to the forward compartment and drain that as well. So you can drain all of the compartments of the boat from either the interior bilge pump or the exterior one. And then there's one more bilge pump in this boat, which is right under here, which is a real mess. In this corner here is an electric one. And that goes out of a completely separate outlet in the uh, transom as well. So there's three through holes. You've got the forward bilge pump that's above the water line also drains the sink. You've got the cockpit bilge pump that drains all the three different compartments depending on how you configure it as well. And that drains out of the transom as close to the center line as I could get it and as high up so that it's always out of the water. Um, so that's out of the water as well. And then you've also got a dedicated one for the electric bilge pump, which realistically, uh, you hope you're never gonna have to use, um, but is mainly so if the boat is left on mooring, um, then actually the, you just leave all the valves open, leave the uh, bilge pump on automatic. So that would be on this switch up here. So you'd slip that to automatic, and then that would be it pumping out just in case you've got any water in this compartment here. A Couple of other little points here, this is, uh, the way that I did the step, I've got a little stainless steel set up here, rail that goes along. This was originally meant to lift up just like that and then underneath there was meant to be a tray um, just under here so that there was going to be things like you know sun cream, binoculars, all that kind of stuff, latch to hold that down. Uh, never quite got around to building that, uh, but I think in terms of a place to sit and some good hand holds, this, uh, this setup worked pretty well actually, so I can sit there and I can just about see out. And I'm like this, so if I sit here, I can see out and it's actually pretty comfortable. Got these two handholds as well, just on the way in. These were uh, a last minute addition, but actually worked really well. Quite happy that I installed those. I thought they were gonna be at like head height, but bad news. The worst thing about this are these guys. This really should, and I should have done it before I left, be covered with some foam. Um, these are terrible news um, for your head. Um, I didn't hit my head at all, but um, actually they're pretty nasty if you were to get, get whacked by one. Um, and then last but not least, I've got the fire extinguisher that is here. Um, so I couldn't think of any other sensible place to put this. Um, so I was thinking on the bulkhead on the way out, that kind of makes sense, just here. Then actually you've got some problems with kicking it off with your feet and as you come down and all that stuff. Over there, I've obviously got the compass, so you don't want it anywhere near that. Um, yeah, it's it's actually quite difficult to find a place to put it. So I ended up with it here, it's not ideal. Um, it is, however, close to the stove, but it is the wrong side, really, of the stove it should be. 
at this end of the boat, I think. Um, it's just, yeah, uh, one of those things that I didn't quite get around to designing in from the beginning, but it might be worth thinking about if you're building one of these from scratch. Um, just think about somewhere to put the fire extinguisher and all the other bits, like the electronics and things like that. This, this is not a great location for it. Potentially, that should be on this bulkhead somewhere up here. If there was a bit more space, a bit more time, I would have done that. Um, but I wouldn't hide it away. It's a racing yacht. Nobody really cares about the wires, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's useful to be able to get to it. If, it. if that had been in a locker, if the AIS unit had been in a locker, and I'd had the problem with it, and I'd have to trace it down to this little connector here, and it was buried somewhere, that would have been a real pain in the ass. As it was, it's all out here. It's very easy to get to. Under here, it's a bit of a mess, because there's basically all bits of the boat were trailered it since um, uh, it came out of the water. I've done all sorts of stuff, but yeah, this is the um, Mini 650 life raft. So it's in its valise. Uh, these are the spreaders and masters and rigging. It's got the outboard here as well, which actually normally lives at the uh, the bow. Um, and then a spare uh, oar for the uh, the wind vane. I've also got the spinning pole and the battens and stuff in here. So it's all a bit of a mess, but under there, I was actually able to get a couple of jerry cans of water um, so I think maybe 40 litres and then back down here um, I was able to get more jerry cans that just slotted in between the keel timbers here you can actually see where they're um, sliding backwards and forwards has worn away some of the paintwork um, so this takes quite a lot of hammer and it is also disgusting in here at the moment as well it's um, <laughs> just bad need of clean um, and then up in the bow there was more water storage as well uh, but I always decanted some of the water from the uh, from the jerry cans into a bottle so I always had something that was easy to to drink from as well and in terms of other bits of cooking so I, I've got the jet boil here and this actually worked really well um, so I already had the jet boil um, it has a small gas cylinder that stays on the back here uh, sorry on the bottom here um, it gimbals this way really well it doesn't really gimbal this way which isn't great it's not a it's not a fantastic mount this this is a sapphire stable stove compact b if you want to buy one um, from sapphire.uk.com um, they are surprisingly expensive but they are good you know this in the sense that it's it's not well it has corroded a little bit <laughs> but uh, but it seems to be fairly robust i have a feeling they've actually done quite a lot of stove gimbals for transatlantic rowers as well um, but it's quite a neat little system so if you want to take it off you can do that um, and it's nice and robust um, it works it's not amazing but it is it does work um, and it is very strong i think so you're unlikely to damage it originally i had it mounted up here and the stove would be here but actually that's a ridiculous idea because um, it's so high up there's a lot of movement at the boat at that point if it spills it spills in your face or your lap down here you can sit in this location and while the boat is going along it's gimbling nicely uh, kind of port and starboard uh, and you can sit here and you can make sure it's all boiling away well and then the sink's really close so actually this location worked quite nicely kind of gets in the way a bit it does look like it gets in the way but actually given that you can remove it that's actually pretty good and then we'll just clear out the, the cooking space and then over here um, I put these in last minute when I was in Lanzarote. These made a massive difference just to hold bottles um, and stuff uh, in this corner. Actually, that was well worth doing. Um, not, not a particularly great fix, probably long term. Some kind of storage here would be good, um, but really it did need something in this corner. And then again, I've got a locker here that goes all the way to the back because these lockers are great. You can get in here, sort of random stuff, but actually if you wanted to get all the way through to the back, it's kind of it's difficult to do that, whereas here it's easier to get your arm in and actually get some get some stuff in there. Um, but having all of the lockers with a with a latch is is quite satisfying. It's quite good. Um, last thing over here, got the kitchen timer on a piece of Velcro. Really loud, waterproof kitchen timer. Works really well for putting uh, for putting on a timer for say 90 minutes or whatever while you're asleep um the only problem that i found is that they didn't wake me up or it was user error so i, I mean who knows um but yeah uh so last bit over here um got some more lockers here same setup got one there got one there um one here so 
same concept. Um, and then over here, got the chart table, same thing again. Uh, it's empty at the moment, but can actually take quite a lot of charts. This is uh, something that I found quite recently. Um, if you're buying waterproof jackets, uh, or if you go into a Chandler's, and they've got a waterproof jacket bag, they are absolutely perfect for keeping charts in. It's just a Ziploc bag, and they gave me like 10 free, and I use them to just keep everything dry, and it was a, it's a good, cheap map pocket, basically, that. Um, so, over here, I've got the electrical panel, and I'm going to go into that in a bit of detail later, but essentially what's going on here is this is a mount for a tablet, Never actually used it, probably totally unnecessary, but actually worked pretty well in uh, in terms of the fact that it holds the tablet pretty solidly. Um, this is a bit of a horror show. This is actually a last minute addition that I had to do in Lanzarote for the low level nav lights. So please ignore that, that's disappearing and getting incorporated properly into the, uh, into the panel here. Um, but what we've got going on here is another timer on a, uh, on a piece of Velcro master isolators so these isolate the batteries which i'll show you in a second so we've got battery bank one and two should probably label these uh battery monitor this is the nasa bm1 it's not the most amazing battery monitor you can now buy but they are indestructible waterproof does exactly what you want it to do and it can show you both two battery banks worth of power so at the moment it's showing 12.5 volts um because it's only got the the batteries on kind of storage mode down there uh, here I've got two USB sockets, I've also got a 12 volt socket, just like a cigarette lighter socket, and those are on this switch panel here, so if I switch that on, that turns those on, obviously if I turn on the isolated, so down here is the switch panel, is, uh, it's relatively cheap, it's supposedly waterproof, um, I did buy this one on eBay, um, I did think it wasn't going to last very well, uh, but actually this one's done alright, so I went around it with a bit of hot melt glue, made it a bit more watertight, um, and so, yeah, I've got sockets, uh, which are these two. That's the chart plotter. That's obviously the VHF. That's the AIS unit. So it's quite useful to be able to turn them off independently. Um, Tricolor light at the top of the mast. Chart light is this one, and that's this one here. So my chart light had a white and a red. Uh, totally unnecessary. Probably just use a head torch. Um, so probably get rid of that one. Um, cabin light is just this one here. That's the only light in here. Uh, but actually that was surprisingly useful um, and then this is the tiller pilot just here kind of ran out of room um, and so that turns on the socket in the cockpit that is fed by a completely separate battery so that's the tiller pilot battery and that's the main battery that one there this thing is total garbage this is the it's a vion digital barometer it i mean i don't even know whether it's accurate um it the display misses digits, it chews through batteries. I don't have anything good to say about this unit whatsoever. So just don't, just ignore that, just don't buy those. Um, it's a terrible device. But the, the, all the electrics are in this waterproof box. All of the connections are via a cable gland. So the whole of the waterproof box should remain intact. All of the switches and panels are kind of gasketed with a little bit of sealant. Um, and so in theory, if the boat took a lot of water down here, it should still work. You should still have most of the electrics working. Right, and last thing is the electrical cabinet. So I've just taken out the screws that go in here. Um, so cabinet in here. Um, it's not mega complicated. Um, but I'll try and walk through it a little bit. So, main negative bus bar, and then we've got the main, that's the shunt for the battery monitor in there. Got the main battery isolators, these are the, so the, sorry, not the isolators, these are the, uh, the trips, basically. So, um, you can actually isolate with them, but they also do have a max amp rating, so I think that one's 50, and that one's 80. Um, this is the always on main positive bus bar and then I've got the uh, so that that is um, that isn't controlled by the isolator this one is controlled by the isolator this is the positive small distribution so that comes into the switch panel that's here and then you've got that switch panel is then interconnected to these which are the 
uh, the different feeds for each of the different circuits. That's a negative for it. Um, it's a bit of a mess, um, but all of the different circuits come in around here. They get attached to the pos and the neg um, at this point. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the small power distribution. This is the battery combiner. So this is the relay which trips um, when it, the battery is at 12.6 volts. So when it drops past 12.6 volts, it separates both batteries. And when it goes above that, then it charges both at the same time. This is a solar um, charger on the solar charge controller. It's a really cheap one from Renergy, um, but actually not bad, works okay. Um, everything is paralleled. So I had two solar panels on the transom. Both have separate wiring entirely into this via a fuse. Um, so the if one of the panels was completely ripped off, then I'd still get charged from the other one. It wasn't combined and the voltage wasn't combined at that point. So not as efficient as it could have been with a higher voltage. I think you get more efficiency out of the um, the panels and the uh, and the charging setup. I'm not an expert on that, but I think that's right. Um, but it does add a lot of redundancy. Um, I would potentially think about how I'd done that. Um, I probably would connect them here with a way in which you could put in a single feed to the charger in series so the, to the controller rather in series so that you're able to get the most efficiency and then if you needed to you'd be able to flick a switch and it would just parallel everything back into it and then you'd be able to um to get the uh, the redundancy factor um other than that um not a huge amount to go into here so all of the switch panel has a thermal circuit breaker each of the batteries has a circuit breaker each of the feeds to the solar and also from the battery monitor is fused here. Um, so yeah, everything is connected. Obviously all the fuses are sized for the wires, not the device. All of the cabling that runs through any bulkhead has to be also watertight. So you'll see down here, as you can see, there is a aluminium panel with a bunch of cable glands on it. So these are <laughs> some cable glands with some loose ones. So all of these connections are also watertight through to the um, the watertight compartment in the front there as well and likewise in the R watertight compartment there's the same setup there's a, an aluminium panel with a bunch of cable glands and then to complete the electrical tour under here under here are the batteries so there are three 55 amp hour Optima yellow top AGM batteries down here. Now I would have used lithium if we were allowed. Um, obviously that is the way of the future. They are quite expensive, but they are light and they have much higher capacity for the same size and weight. Um, so yeah, I would have gone with that. Um, but for now, these seem to work. They're pretty indestructible, impact resistant, blah, blah, blah. They're actually great batteries. Um, heavy, really heavy. Um, a bit unnecessarily heavy to be honest. Um, and this is the only Thing. There we go, there's a better view. This is the, actually the only hatch that doesn't have a latch, you know, but it has a hole ready for one. And they're all down there. So yeah, it's a bit of a, it's not the best setup, if I'm honest. Um, I would have liked to spend a bit more time on the battery storage. Um, they're in their containers, just in case they leak. Um, they could do with lids on. They are lashed down to a number of different points. They don't move, but yeah, it could have done with a bit of neatening up. The rest of the stuff in this locker, I've got some sails in here. And I don't know what you can see down there. So that is the transducer. That is the only through hole that's below the water in this boat. Um, this one is through two layers of nine mil plywood plus the block block for the top section of plywood. So that's actually 27 mils worth of plywood. It's got a couple of mil of glass fiber on the bottom there as well. So realistically, this through holes through about 30 mil of material. Um, obviously, hole sawed out the the aperture for it and then filled it full of mixed resin and strengthened resin with uh, either filler and filler and fibers in and then drilled it out again to the right size for this so all the plywood is sealed um, but yeah so that's the that's the transducer that's down there and that's the only through hole that's below the water so there's quite a lot quite a lot of redundancy built into the design in the sense that it's actually pretty difficult to uh, have an accident in terms of an um, inbuilt through hole with this boat that's about the only one that um, has the risk of that. Um, there's also just next to it, which you can't see down there, there's one of those foam squidgy plug things. So if that was, for example, to, to fall out, I had a plug that was big enough to jam into the hole just in case um, at any point. And then right up forward, 
underneath all that rubbish that's there, but in line with that bulkhead, that has a waterproof compartment at the bottom of that, and it's actually got two separate sections. So there's a very forward crash protection, um, crash box rather, right at the front, and then there's actually another one about 40 centimeters back from that, and then there's um, another one after that. So you've got two separate watertight compartments at this level in the bow, um, right at right up forward and they're just permanently sealed they have an access hatch on top so you can get to them but otherwise they're just a completely couple of sealed units so there's again right at the bow here there's quite a lot of impact protection as well the boat doesn't weigh very much so really if you're going to drive into something like the corner of a container or something um i think you'd probably be all right there's a lot there's a lot of material up at the bow um to, to have, you'd have to damage before you actually puncture the hole I wouldn't like to try it, obviously, but um, it's quite a lot of inherent safety up there. Uh, in terms of other stuff down here, um, I did have the uh, the outboard uh, up here most of the time, just lashed down to these eyes. On the side here, just had some other stuff lashed down. Um, I've got this paddle that I made with the aluminium um, shaft there and the, the oar at the end. Um, some water carriers, they were actually full and obviously somewhere else. Um, but other than that, this is pretty much just storage. It's, I mean, technically, you could call it a berth. I would say it's pretty compact. I mean, if I... I'm in here. It's not really pretty. Give you an idea of the size. So there's not, there's not much room in here. But you could, you could feasibly get... You could probably feasibly sleep in here. It'd be pretty unpleasant. But, um, but it's quite low and it's quite compact. Uh, it's got an access hatch here. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of escape hatch, I guess. But, um, but yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much the boat like that in terms of a tour. Um, there's not much else to tell you. Um, it's small, it's robust. Uh, it's uh, it's surprisingly comfortable for such a tiny boat. There's actually look back out here again without me in the way. There's actually quite a lot of space there. It's not a uh, it's not an unpleasant place to be. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, for a for a transatlantic uh, crossing. Actually, surprisingly good. I think um, there's some plans to have a a two-handed transat, as far as I know, which actually would be pretty interesting. I think you'd probably have one person on deck and steering most of the time, one person below. I don't think that would be unpleasant. I think carrying enough stores for a two-handed transat, that would be a challenge, mainly the water situation. Um, but in terms of the size, for a 19-foot boat, that's not bad.